What's going on YouTube? Welcome back. Looking at a 2014 GMC Sierra K1500 5.3 L83. Customer concern was the service park assist. Um, message was being displayed on the driver information center or your instrument cluster, if you will. This had came in. Um, I had multiple codes stored in the park assist or the front and they call it the K41 front and rear park assist control module. Um, essentially the park assist control module is throwing a lot of codes. Now, if you take a look, these are the codes that we were getting. Uh, we had a Bravo 140502 control module voltage reference output to circuit short to ground. Um, and if you look in the parentheses there, I've documented, you know, pass fail history code. So that basically means that <clears throat> all these codes we're showing a um, current status of pass, or I'm sorry, a current status of fail, um, but they had passed in the past, so a fail pass, fail pass, so on and so forth. Like they're passing sometimes the, ta uh, the circuit test and then other times they're failing. And then they're also going into a history status. So this is good information to know on codes because it kind of gives you the idea, you know, gives you a good interpretation of what codes are happening sometimes and passing sometimes so when you end up with like an intermittent issue um, it's it's good data to know so that was one code we had in there um, the other ones were the 955 uh, with the, the symptom bites are like you know not you can see they're bravo 0 955 04 these are body codes um, that 04 is the symptom bite and those are kind of critical those are pretty critical as well when you're dealing with these kinds of faults because um, they're going to tell you like okay well that that code is for the um, front sensor left middle circuit um, so the left middle left middle sensor on the front bumper that circuit has open or high resistance okay according to that code um, or at least it you know it failed that test at one point and then it also passed it but then you know that's that's kind of my point um, we had a 95518 uh, which is sensor signal for that same sensor set the signal voltage was below the threshold or had low amplitude um, and then we have the 22 symptom bite for that front sensor left metal um, with a signal performance uh, pretty much the same ones um, this inc this three alpha this incorrect component installed that will also set uh when the module doesn't like what it's seeing on um, that circuit okay so it doesn't really recognize it's like oh well i don't really recognize this sensor because whatever i'm seeing i don't like the, i don't like what i'm seeing so somebody plugging something in they shouldn't be um you know kind of kind of one of them codes that just gets set when you have issues like this. Now the 956 is for the um, right middle circuit. So we have the left middle and the right middle. So both middle sensors are flagging DTCs, but we're also, and, and this, the exact same type of DTC. Same with our uh, front sensor right corner. Now I don't know why the front left corner didn't flag the DTC. Um, apparently those pins must have been, they probably had good, the fitment on them was good enough to keep that sensor circuit passing all of these DTCs, okay? Um, <clears throat> because otherwise we would have had, I think it's a 954 code, but let's take a look at service information because one of the first things, <clears throat> after looking at this, one of the first things that comes to my mind is, well, okay, well, was somebody else in here disconnecting things? Um, you know, flip flopping sensors around trying to figure out which sensor might be faulty or something. Um, just looking at these codes, I'm not thinking bad sensor. Um, so, you know, this is a quick DTC scan. So actually one of the first things I did, I didn't get all this on camera, but I'm gonna explain it to you. Um, each little park assist sensor, in case you're not aware, um, they're like those little round circular button looking deals right and they there's generally there's four of them there's a left on the front bumper there's going to be four of them you're going to have your two corners and your two middles okay um what i had an assistant do was just jump in the truck start it up put it in drive obviously holding the brakes on it and you ran over 
And then I uh, took my stethoscope <clears throat> and I just set the tip of the stethoscope, obviously not scratching the paint, but on the center of those, those sensor faces, okay? And what I was doing is I was listening for an audible noise and being emitted from the sensor because that's you'll actually be able to hear them uh, when you do that. And they make a very distinct like noise when they're <clears throat> when they're emitting their signal and what that's doing is it's sending out that signal um like like sonar right and it's it's hitting it's hitting an object and then that when it hits that object that signal comes back that that uh sonar signal you know it bounces off the object comes back to the sensor and the sensor's ticking noise is which is basically determining the distance to that object okay um, we'll get into that here when we go through how this, uh, the description and operation of them. But real quick check, that's what I wanted to do. And what I noticed right away when I did that was that they, you know, the front left one, the one that wasn't flagging DTCs was nice and loud, right? And then as I went down the line going towards the right or the passenger side of the bumper, the signals were more faint, um, not quite as loud as that left one. Now you got to be careful when you're doing this because if you don't have that stethoscope perfectly set on there and stable, um, it will change the, uh, the audible sound. So you want to make sure you're consistent as you go down the line and double check yourself, right? But obviously I could hear that the amplitude on the other ones wasn't quite where it should be. Um, at least not what I would expect. So um, quick down and 30, the rear sensors, same concept, same process, right? Um, so what am I thinking when I look at codes like this? I'm not thinking that I have a, um, a module problem. No, it's possible, but I'm, or a sensor problem. Um, when I see multiple circuit faults for multiple sensors in the same general region, um, I'm, my gut is telling me we have some kind of um, either a wiring issue, um, well, a wiring issue, some kind of corrosion, maybe at a connector, uh, maybe a pin fitment issue. Um, this is generally what my brain's thinking when I'm looking at the overview of it, okay? Sorry for rambling, but that's that's it in a nutshell. So let's take a look at <clears throat> our object detection um, description and operation with front and rear park assist, or RPO UD5, which is what this vehicle had. If we look at <clears throat> this description and operation, um, it says the parking assist system is designed to identify and notify the driver of an object in the vehicle path when moving forward or reversing at speeds of less than five miles an hour. So the system becomes active once you know speeds um, are less than five miles per hour. Okay. Um, the distance and location of the object is determined by four object sensors located in the rear bumper and four object sensors located in the front bumper. The park assist system will notify the driver using, you know, audible beeps um, through the infotainment system or haptic pulses through the driver's seat if equipped. So like some, some systems have the, the vibrating portion of the seat to also warn you that, hey, you're getting too close, you're about to hit this object. Okay. Um, it's, it's just a parking assist so you don't run into cars, you don't bump into things. Okay. Um, the park assist system is made up of the following components. You got your part, uh, your K182 park assist control module, um, your front park assist sensors, your rear park assist sensors, your park assist switch, um, your park assist indicator, your infotainment system, and your safety alert seat system if it's equipped. Okay, um, I don't think this one had the the seat um, alert system. Park assist control module. So the um, Park Assist Control Module provides a reference voltage and a low reference to the eight object alarm sensors. Okay? The Park Assist Control Module receives individual signals from each of the eight sensors and determines the location and distance of an object on these inputs. When an object is detected, the Park Assist Control Module will send a serial data message to the infotainment sensor or infotainment system requesting an audible alert. So there that module is the link to your infotainment center or where you're going to see on your um, center display it, it, it's all linked together and the, and that's the audible noise you hear coming from the radio system that's why they have to be um, tied together and they're and they're doing this communication over a serial data message okay 
Uh, park assist sensors are located in the front and rear bumpers. We discussed that. Sensors are used to determine the distance between an object and the bumper. Each sensor emits an ultrasonic frequency, which is reflected off an object located in front or behind the vehicle. So that ultrasonic um, signal um, is being emitted from the sensor, and then it bounces off the object, comes back, and that's how it's determined. That's how the voltage is. Uh, the sensor itself will emit that signal voltage to the uh, module, the park assist module, and that'll tell it, hey, this one's within three feet, two feet, or whatever meters or whatever they're using. That's how it's going to do that. The reflections are received by the sensors. The time difference, be so the time difference between the emission of the frequency and when the reflection is received is known as sensor echo time. Um, it is used to determine the distance to the object. The sensor reports this information to the park assist control module. So the sensor tells it through a voltage signal or a digital signal, like, hey, this is this is what that this is the distance to that object. And the computer can tr interprets that the park assist module interprets that. And it's like, OK, and then it sends that information over that serial data line um, to the infotainment center to you know, make the noises and so on and so forth. The park assist switch can be activated, deactivated. So it's basically your activation or deactivation switch for the driver. Um, you know, if you want it to, if you want it to work, if you don't want it to work, you can disable it with this switch. Okay, that's all they're saying there. Um, the park assist control module applies voltage and monitors the park assist switch signal circuit. The park assist switch is normally open switch with the switch open. Voltage seen at the park assist control module is high. When the park assist switch is pressed, the switch is closed, and the signal circuit is pulled to ground. So that's how it knows whether or not it's on or off. Okay. With the switch closed, voltage seen at the park assist control module is low. The park assist control module will respond to this by activating or deactivating the park assist function. Park assist indicator. Okay, that would be your indicator. Um, when the park assist system is enabled, the park assist control module will <clears throat> illuminate the indicator on the switch. The indicator receives voltage through a high control circuit from the from the BCM and is controlled through a low control circuit by the park assist control module. Okay, so good to know. If you're diagnosing that portion of that this this is why you would go to circuit description and operations so you understand um, all the different all the different modules, all the different circuits you need to be looking at when you have an issue with that system, okay? Infotainment system. The infotainment system controls <clears throat> the audible alert for the park assist alert. If an object is detected, the infotainment center will command beeps as an audible alert to the driver. Okay. Safety alert seat if equipped. So if you have the seat um, alert system, uh, that memory seat module controls the haptic alert provided by the seats. Okay. If an object is detected, the memory seat module will command pulses to the driver's seat. So you need to keep in mind that um, if you had seat alert with a park assist system, now you have another module that you need to consider. So we're talking, you could have BCM, uh, park assist control module, infotainment system, and then your memory seat module. I mean, you're dealing with multiple computers transmitting these um, signals over a serial data message. And that's how they're basically telling each other what to do, when to do it, based on these inputs from these sensors. Okay. Hope that makes sense. <clears throat> park assist operation, when an object is within the measure, measuring range of the sensor, the ultrasonic pulse is reflected and received by the sending or the neighboring sensor. The sensor converts the signal into a voltage signal and sends the signal to the park assist control module. The parking assist control module evaluates the received sensor signals as soon as an object is within the measuring range. The park assist control module sends a message via serial data to the infotainment system to provide an alert signal or an alert, audible alert, right? The park assist system can detect objects great, greater than three inches wide. Okay, so that's real important to know, and 10 inches tall. So we're not talking very much. You know, it can detect stuff that small. Um, the system cannot detect objects below the bumper or underneath the vehicle. So if somebody's laying down, you're not. That's not going to catch it. It has to be, you know, just above where those sensors can get that signal to hit. So, the park assist system can be activated and deactivated by pressing the park assist switch. We talked about that. When the transmission is in reverse, the park assist is automatically activated unless disabled by that switch. So, anytime that vehicle, you know, obviously nothing's going to be active until it's in reverse or drive, right? Until the vehicle's 
gets the input that, hey, that transmission's being moved. So again, <clears throat> the Park Assist system is using information over the network um, for that transmission range sensor to know whether or not it's in drive or whether or not it's in reverse, and that's going to initiate the process to um, start emitting signal from these sensors. Okay? The Park Assist control module carries out a self-test and monitors the sensors for electrical and mechanical faults. Monitoring is the <clears throat> monitor is the power supply of each sensor and the sensor signals. Okay, mud, ice, and snow cause obstruction of the function of each sensor. The Park Assist control module also determines if the correct type of sensor is installed. <clears throat> if any of these tests fails, a DTC with corresponding symptom is set, and the Park system, Assist system is deactivated. So. There is some good information. So if you put in a sensor that doesn't have the right resistance or right uh, criteria or build to it, like the OEM sensor, it's not going to like it. It's, that module is going to say, uh -uh, nope, that's an incorrect sensor. I, I don't like you. Um, and you deal with this a lot when you start dealing with aftermarket electronics because aftermarket um, doesn't have the rights, so to speak, to the internals and the specifications of an OEM sensor. So again, this is why guys often say, you know, better off to go with the manufacturer sensor um, if you want it, you know, you don't want to be dealing with it. Now we don't have a, always have that option in today's world because of supply and demand, but generally speaking, I like to stick to OEM. It's just the way it's going to be, especially when you're dealing with warranty because it's a requirement. When an object is about 120 centimeters, 47 inches to 31 centimeters, 12 inches in front of the vehicle. The proximity of the object from the vehicle is communicated via the instrument cluster. Hmm. So now you're dealing with IPC as well. So uh, when an object is very close, less than six, uh, 0.6 meters or two feet in the vehicle rear, or less than 3.3 meters or one foot in the front vehicle directly in the vehicle directly front or less than 0.6 meters or two feet in the vehicle front sides um, a continuous beep will sound from the front or rear or both sides of the safety alert seat if equipped with pul will pulse so it's like basically giving you the distance um, to sensor parameters <clears throat> uh, a distance greater than you know, 0.3 meters or one foot in the front vehicle front head on will keep the park assist system from uh, providing feedback while in stop or go traffic. You're not talking about a whole lot of distance, you know. So once you get beyond, once you get beyond that one foot threshold in the front of the vehicle, you know, and then they're doing this because they assume that, you know, you're not going to be sitting right, you know, you know how people drive, but you're not going to be sitting right on the bumper of the, the guy in front of you sitting and stop and go traffic. So otherwise it'd be sitting there going beep, 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 beep all the time, right? Service park assist. The driver information center displays service park assist. Um, when the park assist control module detects a malfunction in the park assist system and the system is disabled. The driver information center also displays service park assist message, which is exactly what we had on this. When a loss of communication occurs with the park assist control module. Now, don't get confused by that because we didn't have any communication faults code set. Now, it doesn't mean that that park assist control module couldn't, may or may not be communicating, but given our codes, you got to kind of use common sense here. That's why it's important to read this stuff before you attack a problem, right? Park Assist Off. The Park Assist Off message is displayed in the Driver Information Center when the Park Assist system is disabled due to conditions that disable or inhibit the system. The Park Assist Control Module requests the Driver Information Center display the Park Assist Off when it detects that one of the following conditions are met. So, in other words, if the Park Assist system is manually disabled using the Park Assist switch, um, an object is attached to the rear of the vehicle, such as a trailer, bicycle rack, trailer hitch, receiver, or tow bar. Also, an object extending beyond or lower a lower tailgate will disable that system. So that's important to know. Um, the park assist sensors are covered by, you know, like an excess amount of snow, mud, ice, dirt, sludge, you know, slush, whatever, depending on your driving conditions. Um, the vehicle bumper is damaged, so it's important to look and see, you know, has it been in a hit, you know. Um, Excessive paint thickness on a replacement park assist sensor. So if it's painted too heavily on the front of that 
where, you, where I was telling you to check for your audible signal, um, it's going to inhibit its ability to send and receive that ultrasonic message. Okay. Um, the Parkinson's sensors are disrupted by vibrations like those caused by a large nearby vehicle or from heavy equipment such as a jackhammer. So that can affect them. So imp good information to know. Um, let's move on um, to, I'm going to show you guys the circuit. So here's, if you look, there's a, up at the top, you got your K41 front and rear park assist control module there. Um, what I was concerned about it, and I've got it highlighted here in red for you, is you can see on this diagram, there's an X150 connector, okay? Inline heart, if, you know, going, the sensors are all down here at the bottom, right? And if we look, if we look at the sensors, <clears throat> you can see that all of them share, I mean, look at circuit 5213, okay? This 5213 circuit goes up to a junction, junction 105, and they're all tied together on that junction. And they all share that 12 volt feed on circuit 5213, okay? See, I, I hope you guys are seeing what I'm seeing, right? So the 12 volt feed is coming from our module. Our, our module is provi providing that 12 volt feed to all them sensors and they all share a power feed, okay? We have two inline connectors from the module to the park assist sensors, okay? This X150 is gonna be further back in the vehicle towards the module and the X100 is gonna be towards the front bumper, okay? Um, I'll show you guys where to find that. Anyways, <clears throat> if we look at the other side or the low reference side of this, these park assist sensors, you'll see 5214 circuit, okay? The 5214 circuit is our low reference circuit. So our module is not only providing the um, power to these sensors, the 12 volt feed, but it's also providing the ground for these sensors, okay? Then when we look at each individual signal circuit as drawn, you'll see that circuit 5215, 5216, 5218, and 5217 are our signal circuits for each individual sensor. Now they can't share a signal circuit because duh, like they're individual signals for each, for each sensor, right? They can share power, they can share ground, but they can't share their signals, okay? Because otherwise how would the computer know who's saying what, okay? If you look in the module, you're gonna see that little symbol up there with the little arrow to the left, right? What that's telling you is that that is a, that little arrow is telling you that that, 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 mo that is being monitored by that module, okay? That's, that's essentially what that's telling you. With that full-time power feed going to each one of them sensors, so let's take a look at the front, ob the we'll just look at the left outer, front object sensor left outer, um, B78 Alpha, okay? You can see that they're, they've drawn like the, sig the little uh, wave going out and the wave being received back. That's telling you how the sensor kind of works. You know, it emits a signal and then it's received back. And then inside of that sensor in that little box is a little brain, a little um, digital receiver that converts that voltage change that it's seeing based on them frequencies um, into a message or a signal going back to the module um, on 5215, circuit 5215, and it's monitoring that signal voltage, okay? So that sensor is gonna produce that signal and send it up, and it's being monitored um, by the module, okay? So I hope that makes sense, not too complicated. Um, I'm not gonna show you in this video the signals of each sensor. I could have, but I didn't have time. Um, I think I've done that in another video, but I, I don't know. It's been a while. Look at my playlist. Um, in either case, what I, based on that code setting criteria after looking at circuit, uh, the circuit um, of this entire system, my first thought was, is, well, what's going to be the easiest to get to? We could certainly reach up in the bumper, pull a sensor um, connector off, do our power and ground check there. Um, the problem with that is if you look at how they're spliced together on their their on that J105 junction, you could miss a problem in, in somewhere in there by going to an individual sensor because you're further down the line. Um, like say you had resistance issues and stuff. So I would generally 
like to go to one of these connectors and I chose that X100 connector because that's the closest one to the sensors. Um, and I figured, you know, it's got to be fairly easy to get to. So that's where I was going to go. I'm not going to the module because generally speaking, it's not easy to get to modules and it's not easy to do your checks. That's kind of like a if I have to kind of thing. Um, so if I go to this X100 connector, I can do my power and grounds checks. Now, let me pull up this other diagram and I'm going to show you what I'm about to show you in the video. Okay, so if we look here, I've drawn this out for you essentially how I have this, this hooked up in the testing so that it kind of gives you a better idea of what I'm actually doing in this. Um, so I've drawn the voltmeter readings that I'm going to show you on the video. Um, and you can see that I'm tied into circuit 5214 um, and the top here and 5213, which is the, the power feed. So the power feed and the um, low reference or the ground circuit, but I'm tied in just before X100. So I'm telling you that I'm on the harness side going to module monitoring it with the voltmeter. And I'm also putting a two and a half amp 194 bulb test light that I made um, essentially in series so that it will light the test light to show me up. I got good power. I can, I've got a circuit that can, that module can put out 12 volts to that point and it's able to carry at least two and a half amps, which is more than enough for the size of the wiring. So that tells me that a lot of things. That tells me that on this side of the harness of the X100, that my voltage is, you know, I'm monitoring voltage, 13.2 volts with a battery charger on. Um, and I got two and a half amps, okay? So of, of capability there. And this is with everything plugged in, okay? Um, or unplugged, it doesn't really matter, key on, engine off. So I know on that side of the circuit, we're good. So I still want to check the other side of that connector and that's going to rule out my voltage drop across those pins, if that makes sense. I've got the, the 194 test lamp on the opposite side, which would be the front bumper, essentially on the opposite side of that X100 connector, the, the harness going from that connector to the front bumper or to our sensors. Okay? So if I, <clears throat> the fact that I had a two and a half amp light on both sides of that connector and I was showing a 13.2 volts on one side 13 I, that's essentially a 10 millivolt drop across that connector now I'm still not done here uh, this is the problem when you you know voltage drop testing is great don't get me wrong it's a it's a very necessary test but when I was testing this I was moving that connector okay um, I disconnected it and reconnected it and a lot of times um, doing that, you can fix intermittence, okay? Um, so testing, sometimes you don't have a choice. I mean, in order for me to pierce in here, I'm going to have to touch that area. There's a good possibility my problem might just go right away, and, it, and in this case, it did. Um, as soon as I got tapped in and I did these measurements and had disconnected or reconnected the connector after you know doing my tests, the problem went away and it wouldn't set any codes anymore. So this doesn't mean you're done, okay? Because <clears throat> this is what I wanted you guys to get out of this video is be very mindful that you still need to do your pin drags, okay? If you don't see an issue at the X100 connector, well, then you probably didn't find your problem. It may be in the X150 connector. It could be an issue at the module, okay? With pin fitment or something of that nature. Um, it could certainly very well be a short in the harness somewhere. So when you're dealing with intermittents, I just want you guys to be aware that um, this is a variable. Okay? I was pretty confident, on, and you'll see in the video, that I had a pin fitment issue. So, of course, we're going to do our visual inspection of the connector, both sides, male and female. Um, and then we're also going to look at, and we're going to actually do a physical pin drag. Okay? Um, I only showed the female side because I was the only side with the issue. The male side, I could see that the pins weren't quite dragging. You couldn't see the drag marks on the male pins like I'd like to see. Um, that's usually a dead indication that you got some type of pin feminine issue. So with that being said and me rambling my ass off, let's get into it. All right. So you can see we're getting 12.1, 12, about 12.6 volts. I got the battery tender on there and we're able to light a two and a half amp test light on this harness side circuit for this Park Assist sensors. So this red one here is for my test light, this double banana here and my meter's tied into the back of it. 
and basically that's that yellow violet and that's the um, that yellow violet wire that I'm pierced into there is the harness side this is our X100 connector under the bumper here you can see I'm already prepared on the harness side going to each arc assist sensor in the bumper I'm already prepared on the other side of it but I just wanted to make sure that I had a good 12 volt, 12 volt supply from the module and I'm actually using with this test light I'm using the low reference or the ground for those park assist sensors on the other side which is a black oh, it's a black violet I think or a black blue and uh, we're getting 12.63 volts with a nice two and a half amp load so I'm not too concerned about that side of it um, let's plug it in and see what happens so I just, I'm up to 13.19 volts. I'm actually charging the battery right now, it's low. So just be mindful of that. I'm still on the other side of the harness. Um, and if we go to the other side of the connector, hold on one second. All right, we're in on the other side of the connector and this is basically just ruling this out. Now we will do a voltage drop as well, but we got 13.2 volts. Okay, now again, that's the low reference and the that is the that is the low reference and the um, 12 volt feed to these park assist sensors so if I want to check on the other side of the circuit <clears throat> to see if <clears throat> it's able to carry a load we can plug our light in on the other side let's see if it'll light it okay so we're able to carry two and a half amps on the other side of our X100. All right, we'll get into these codes in the edits, but we're gonna dump the codes out. I've got everything connected before we do anything further. I'm gonna dump all these codes. I've got everything documented. All right, so now, I just wanna see what codes are gonna reset, if any. Door. <clears throat> dismiss, dismiss. Put open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's put her in drive. So right now those sensors are emitting their signals. I came in with a park assist sensor code for um well you'll see the codes. When I listened to them initially with the stethoscope, they didn't have a very loud signal on any of them, almost like they were having trouble getting their power feeds. So we're going to re-listen to these. I'm going to have to grab an assistant, and unfortunately I'm not going to be able to, obviously I'm not going to be able to sh give you guys the audio um, from that, but I can, I can explain that to you how I'm doing that. And now it's not showing um, service to the park assist system. So did we have a connector issue? I, I think we did. So um, obviously we're gonna do pin drags on all those pins, but um, that's where we're at, so. Well, it's pretty sad, but I was able to find the two test leads that I'm gonna need to do a pin drag on this connector. So here's your diagnostic test probe numbers, okay? So, I've got it running right now, and I'm doing a code scan just to see if any of those codes reset. Uh, Park assist module, zero code, so we definitely had a pin fitment issue on the power and the grounds at this connector. Um, so, I'm just going to disconnect it with it running. I don't really care if it's running. Let me disconnect this. All right. So we're gonna do, I'm mainly concerned with the female side here for those power and those grounds. Keep rolling here. Yeah, I don't like. are 
calls. The only one with any drag is that one. What is that? One, two, three. There's a fourth one in. Yeah. One, two, three, four. That's just purple white. All these terminals are loose. Every one of them. Well, these don't, these aren't occupied, but that's kind of pissed poor. That's the ground. That one's even kind of pissed poor. I'm not. I'm not liking the way this these connector pins feel. Very loose. So, <clears throat> you can barely see the drag marks on the other side. It's no wonder it's throwing codes. Let me uh, open this up. Disconnect my battery quick. Right, so just to give you an idea, um, I'm gonna do most of this off camera, guys. I just can't film it while I'm working. But if you look here on the side of the terminal, you'll see that little opening in the side there. I'm sticking my tool in there, a small tool in there to spread, well, to help bend that femur or that tang down to get my my uh, pin drag back. I've already quoted all new terminals for this, just in case this doesn't work for the long term, and we'll just repin the whole connector. But that's what I'm doing right now, okay? One by one, one by one, to release them. Um, if you look down in the cavity, you'll see that little plastic tang along the top side there. You gotta lift that little plastic tang gently up as you pull back on the pin and then the pins slide out the back, of course, right? So that's what we're doing. This is the low reference wire for those signal sensors. Now, I just did a pin drag on it after spreading it, and it's a lot better, so. If you gained anything out of this video, I apologize I didn't get the after captures of the repair. There really isn't much to it. Have an assistant jump in the truck, clear all your codes out, of course. Um, have them put it in drive, reverse, whatever sensors you're checking, whether it be the front or the rear. Use the stethoscope, listen, see what your signals sound like. You should have a nice, clear and crisp, um, tick, audible tick noise from them sensors emitting their signal. And when you put that stethoscope <clears throat> on them sensors, you're going to put it on the center of the little round portion of the sensor face. You know, be careful so you don't scratch it, of course. And you set your stethoscope on there and just listen as somebody's got it in drive or reverse, whichever sensor you're checking, and just listen. And you should hear a nice tick, 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 like consistent ticking noise of it emitting its signal. And that's what was really faint and weak initially before I tackled anything to do with the connector, the pins, or the grounds, or anything, was I just did that quick check when I had the message on the dash. Now what led me to believe there was a fitment issue at this connector um, obviously the codes that were being stored or you know I, the fact that they were in a pass fail status is 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 a big one so i had a pass fail 
you know, like a like it's passing sometimes and then it's failing sometimes and it's flagging this these DTCs in multiple sensors. Um, and it also has that circuit code in there for voltage. Um, and the fact that it was, you know, uh, in multiple sensors, um, it led me to believe that there was some kind of um, harness fitment issue somewhere, okay? Uh, the chances of it being a bad sensor, considering it was multiple sensors on that front bumper, is, is slim to none, okay? Now, the ones that said, in, in uh, you know, the codes that said um, incorrect component installed, um, those can be set falsely because of just... If, it, if that module doesn't see what it wants to see when it, in terms of monitoring them signal voltages, it's going to think that there's a improper sensor installed or something. So a lot of these codes get set, they're erroneous, um, they're all related to one another. <clears throat> but using common sense here, um, going after what seemed to be the most, the easiest spot to go to. I didn't want to have to go up to sensors. I mean, I could have, uh, but why not just go right to that connector um, I don't want to go to the module because that's a that's another process. Um, if we had to go to that point, we would. But in this case, <clears throat> after pulling that connector apart, doing well, of course, doing my power and grounds checks on both sides of it, essentially doing a voltage drop test on both sides of the connector, um, both the male side and the female side, or harness side to module and harness side to sensors, um, it was clear that we didn't have a like at that moment in time when we're testing, we probably fixed it just by touching it, okay? Um, and in fact, that was the case because as soon as I disconnected to do my checks and stuff and reconnected, the, the faults all went away. So that tells you the intermittent nature of it is related to most likely pin fretting. After a visual inspection, after a pin drag test, which is one of the big things I want you to take away from this is do your pin drags. Uh, pin drags are a critical step in the diagnostic process, and it's a step that a lot of guys. <laughs> are you in the video? It's a step that a lot of guys miss. I think it's a big step that a lot of people miss. You know, get the proper pins, uh, the pin drag tool or test lead, and do your drags. And really, you know, it doesn't take much, just a little bit of looseness in a paint in a female side of a connector is going to cause some serious um <laughs> that's my daughter it's going to cause some serious issues okay um and it can do this kind of stuff <clears throat> so a lot of times it's that simple i i don't feel bad um about taking and depinning it and tightening up all the pins and getting the drag back as a um fix because this was a customer pay um, ticket so it's coming out of the customer's pocket. Regardless, I don't want, um, I, 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 of course I warn the customer, you know, hey, you can try this. Um, we'll look up and quote you to repin the whole connector, but let's do that if this doesn't take care of it, okay? You know, if it continues to be an issue or it's coming and going, and, you know, so yada, 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 so on and so forth, you know, then yeah, let's let's just go ahead and take care of it. That would be the ideal fix is just repin the whole connector. But if we're able to get by by doing what I did, hey, great, you know, customer don't have to pay that money to have it repinned. So as far as I know, this has not been an issue since I touched it. <clears throat> uh, customer hasn't been back. It's been a few weeks now. So big thing I wanted you guys to take away is just, you know, something simple, but <clears throat> not so simple, you know? Anyways, take care. Thanks for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Catch you on the next one.